So we're very, very, very happy to have Dave, uh, Dr. Livka with us today. Um, as the slide says, uh, Dr. Livka is the uh, director for the uh, Center for Advanced Computing at Cornell University. And he's also the uh, director for research uh, computing over at the Well Cornell Medical College. He's a veteran in high performance computing with many, many years of experience in parallel computing and um, more specifically in um, uh, scientific computing in academic institutions. Uh, so very, very happy to have you today. Thank you very much. Today we'll talk about uh, Red Park, right? Yeah. Thank you. Is it okay if I sit or would, I, mean, I think I'll be a distraction if I stand so you can look at the slides. If you can, everyone hear me okay? Okay, so hi, I, 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 thank you for the nice introduction. I'm Dave Lifka. Um, Dave is fine. Um, you can interrupt me anytime throughout the presentation, please do. Um, yeah, so I wear um, several hats, which makes my life interesting. I ride a bus between Ithaca and uh, here, John Ruffing, my colleague, uh, has been at the Weill Cornell Medical College for as long as I've been in Ithaca, which is about 16 years, John. Yeah. And he, he, he just moved to Ithaca and rides back and forth, too. So. Um, we have a really nice bus service that you can you can ride to if you ever want to come visit. Um, <laughs> and uh, so um, today, I, I actually wear a couple other hats that may be of interest to some of you. Um, I'm the coordinator for architecture for Exceed, which is the next 10 years of what was formerly TerraGrid. So this is an NSF um, research computing sort of national cyber infrastructure. Um, so I've been doing that, and, and um, I'm, as in that role, I'm the point person for cloud computing for that organization, uh, that funded grant uh, as part of NSF. And so um, some of the things that I'll share with you today are based on those experiences, and others are based on things I've learned at uh, Weill Cornell Medical College. And so, you know, whatever you, I'm happy to talk about whatever you want. Um, what I thought I'd do first is sort of give you a, li a little bit of uh, background around the center for, uh, about the center for advanced computing so uh, i've been i've been in, in ithaca for 16 years now at the center for Adva it was formerly the theory center when we lost our national funding um, we sort of rode, rode a roller coaster that wasn't very fun for a while funding curves and um, we became uh, about six years ago essentially a core facility so folks in life sciences get that a lot of other fields don't but we are essentially a core facility for all of Cornell University. So we survive if we provide services that the researchers want, and we don't if we don't. It's really that simple. And so we have our cost recovery model. We charge for everything we do. And um, the main thing, our, our mission is really to enable the success of Cornell researchers. That's, that's it. It's that simple. We're not researchers ourselves. We're su we support research. Okay? We, have, we have people that have PhDs in physics and astronomy and all different people on the staff that that are very smart people, but they know how to apply their skills and show other people how to do computational science. So um, we have we provide consulting in lots of different areas. We have different computing uh, models, pay as you go, lease contracts, which is sort of a lot of people know as a condo model, um, subscriptions for Red Cloud, which is a model we're moving more and more towards, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, and then we also do a lot of private cl clusters. Um, so we have professional staff that are subsidized, and you'll see a little bit about this, by the Vice Provost for Research in Ithaca. And we run dedicated research clusters for different groups. We have actually over 32 of these private clusters for all over Cornell, and including some from the med school. Um, and then we're part of um, several national cyber infrastructure grants, Succeed I mentioned, um, but we're also partnered with the Texas Advanced Computing Center. We were a partner for education and training for the Ranger system, and now for the Stampede system, which is going to be uh, on the order of a 10 petaflop system. So today, what I really want to talk to you about is um, Red Cloud, which is a new offering that we launched last fall at Supercomputing. So that was roughly mid-November. Um, and it's really today two pieces, infrastructure as a service and software as a service. But we're actively considering a third service, which is platform as a service, which I'm not really going to talk to you about, but the platform is going to be an HPC cluster with a subscription model. Um, that's what we're working towards right now. But today I'm going to talk about these two things, and I think these are, of, you know, most people are most interested in these two services. So, um, you know, I'm always asked, why did you do this? Why did you build your own cloud? Why not just use Amazon? Why not just use Google? Why, you know, whatever. Why did you do it? And so, you know, research computing means really something different to each of us. And 
scientific workflows have different requirements at different steps, right? So you think about, you know, think about something like sequencing where you're acquiring data, then you do multiple stages of analysis. Sometimes you archive the data, sometimes you store, you know, intermediate results, sometimes you go want to pull it back. And all those different things have different requirements, different compute requirements, different network requirements, different storage requirements, and on and on. And so cloud can fit some of those, but not really all of them. And especially if you've tried moving data in and out of any of the public clouds and gotten the bill, you know what I'm talking about, okay? So, and the other thing is that, especially in, in, re in academic research, connecting to and other cyber infrastructure resources is important. It's not an island, right? Um, and if you're doing secure data, that's another whole interesting um, problem. But for now, we're just talking about open data, basic, basic research data. And so we talked to people on campus and they said, well, you know, the, the common question I got for the Center for Advanced Computing is why do we need you anymore? We have the cloud. So we just push everything out to the cloud and we're done, right? And so you can't really say, no, the cloud sucks and that won't work. If you want to keep your job as a director of the center, you better have a better answer than that. So we said we need to figure this out. We need to figure out where cloud can play and where it makes sense. And if it, if it does, well, maybe they're right. And if it doesn't, we, we better have a really good answer for that. So we started a pilot um, using Eucalyptus, which is an open source stack. Um, and I'll tell you more about that. Um, and we found out that there was a lot of reasons why an internal cloud made a lot of sense. And, 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 we, and then we started talking to faculty and said, if we build it, will you come? And they said, yeah, here's the things I didn't like. I got this, I thought I was gonna pay this much to use Amazon and then I got this bill. And that was not what I was expecting. And so nobody likes a bad surprise. And furthermore, we, we, through the services we offer at the Center for Advanced Computing and at ITS at Wild Cornell Medical College, we know that faculty are very risk averse when it comes to grant money, right? So they wanna know that if, if I'm paying you, it can't go over and I know what I can budget and that's it, right? So don't, don't come back and tell me you need more money later. So this is a lot, this is a lot of the motivation behind our, um, uh, subscription model, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, one of the things the center does very well is provide economies of scale. So sharing hardware, software, people, um, so you saw my consulting staff, um, where it makes sense, right, and not where you, where you need specific expertise all the time. And paying for what you need when you need it, not all the time. So a lot of people will think, well, the best way to do it is to write a grant, grant to NIH, get a cluster, and park it there. And every day that you don't use it, that hardware is getting worth less. It's pay someone's paying for power, someone's paying for cooling, and it's taking up space, and someone's trying to keep it patched. And if you're not using it, it's maybe not the most effective. On the other hand, we have people at Cornell that have huge clusters that keep them flat out all the time, and then it does make sense, because it's way cheaper to do that if you can keep it busy all the time. So, so there's, I guess, m Part of what I'm saying is there's no right answer to this, but I want to give you some things to think about when you think about cloud. Um, the one nice thing that a lot of faculty wanted is a customized environment for their discipline. So if you build a generic cluster, a lot of faculty will come and say, well, it's great, but I need this software, and I need this version of this software, and I need this much memory, and this much network capacity, and on and on and on with the requirements. And then you quickly find out that if you built what would make everybody happy, it would be really expensive, right? And it doesn't work. So sometimes providing a resource where you can have your own environment on hardware that can be shared works out well, and this is where cloud really did make a lot of sense. So, um, you know, they want to have collaboration tools. So, for example, you know, well, I'll show you wikis, things like that, or sharing data where uh, you have a lot of data you want to be able to share with your collaborators or even with your own group, um, and you want to keep it in one place so it's not getting scattered all over and you can find it. Um, and you want to be able to, you also would like to be able to support different computing models like Hadoop, so MapReduce and things like that on the same hardware. So these were the things that sort of motivate us to, to look further. And so we came up with Red Cloud, and I said we launched it in um, November of last year at Supercomputing. And so one of the things we, we wanted to make sure we did was provide predictable, reproducible, reproducible and reliable performance. So if you, get, if you run on a public cloud, they oversubscribe the hardware. So you're not getting the memory, the network bandwidth, and the core to yourself. You're sharing it. And if someone else is sucking it up hard, you're getting less, and you can't guarantee you'll get the same performance every time. That's why you pay so little. As soon as you say, I need guaranteed performance, your rate goes up, okay? So now they have these different models where you can pay more and get essentially a dedicated cluster, but it's a lot of money, okay? So, so we don't oversubscribe anything, 
All right. So you'll see our, our uh, infrastructure as a service subscription or uh, the way you can allocate them. We have, uh, and you'll see the hardware configuration, but we don't oversubscribe anything, the memory, the processors, or the network. Okay, so that means when you run, it should always run very, very close to the way it ran the previous time. Okay, um, it's convenient. So if you need something up and running yesterday, you can do it. You can get it running quickly um, as opposed to going out and procuring a system, bringing it in, getting it set up. And again, you have to think about how long you're going to use a system. Sometimes the procurement effort does make sense, other times not. Um, and so the, the two cases that we really targeted when we started were, number one, I need a big, fast machine for only a little bit of time, right? I have a deadline. I've got a paper due. I've got to get some results done for a grant, whatever it is. That's, and, and then I'm done, and I don't need it. So you wouldn't buy a machine for that, right? So that's an interesting use case that we did not have, sort of a corner case that we did not have a good solution for in Ithaca. Um, and then the other one is I need a small server to run continuously. I don't want to go out and buy a server and pay someone to maintain it or have my grad student maintain it when all I really need is one core to run a wiki, right? It doesn't make sense to have hardware aging. It, it's going to be idle most of the time. And so this is one of the other cases that we wanted. Um, we wanted absolutely no hidden costs. All the costs are completely transparent. You get what you pay for and nothing, you don't pay for anything extra. We don't charge you, send you any extra bills. Um, we wanted fast access to your data because it's a research cloud. It's not, it's not a general purpose cloud. It's focused so we have 10 gigabit connectivity to all the nodes and directly to the outside world. And you can use Globus Online to move your data in and out. Okay, everyone familiar with Globus Online? Any, anyone not? So Globus Online is, um, is a software as a service and it's a third party transfer network transfer mechanism that was developed by the Globus team at Argonne National Lab. I was at Argonne for 10 years before I came to, uh, to Cornell. And it's Ian Foster and Steve Tiki, and they've been funded for 20 years at least in the development of Globus, which is real, has its roots in grid computing. So Ian Foster is famous for grid computing. So what Globus Online does is you, you run a little piece of software. You can run it on your Mac. You can run it on your server. Um, and it uses a, a little tiny grid FTP server, and it says, OK, I need to move 20 terabytes of data from the med school at, on 1300 York to Ithaca and you say do it and then it takes it as a, as a almost like a batch request and it takes care of it for you so you can disconnect and go home and it takes care of retries it takes care of it takes care of failures and retries it takes care of authentication uh, timeouts all of that for you so you it really is an effective and they do some optimization of the network so you get way better bandwidth than you would you would just doing a generic FTP so, so we use that as a as a primary transfer. Yes. I mean, so do you have a Globus Connect multi-user endpoint? Yep, yep. So when you connect when you connect to CAC's Pound Home, which is an endpoint, you, and you log in as you, yes. you see your directory. Yes, we also have an endpoint on our end. Perfect. And that would definitely facilitate cake. Absolutely, be a piece of cake. Okay. Yep. So. Um, so the, the two economies of scale that we really targeted were infrastructure as a service, so sharing hardware instead of buying a cluster and letting it sit idle, and then sharing software. And the software in particular that we're, we focused on was MATLAB. So we were funded by the National Science Foundation two years pre previous to launching Red Cloud to provide a MATLAB, a parallel MATLAB resource for the TerraGrid. How many people use MATLAB? Anybody? OK, several. OK, so MATLAB has a product called MATLAB Distributed Compute Server, which lets you run parallel MATLAB. And if you have the client installed on your Mac or Linux or Windows machine that has the PCT, the Parallel Compute Toolbox, you can actually say set sched CAC, and it'll actually automatically package everything up and run it automatically on Red Cloud and Ithaca, and you don't have to know anything more. You don't have to know about the batch system. You don't have to know about the file transfers. It takes care of everything for you. So we built that for TerraGrid, and then we wanted to keep it going because we had users and we, so that, that from outside of Cornell. So we have that today. Um, so you'll, you'll hear more about that. Other things that we provide that you won't get at a, uh, a, a public cloud, you get expert help. So if, you know, if, you're, if your system goes down and you need help, they're not going to pick up the phone, right? And we will. So we, we charge for it, but we'll do it. Okay, and I'll show you all those rates I'll show you in a minute. Um, but th it's really an important thing. I was actually at um, a eucalyptus conference a few weeks ago um, in the financial district, and Puma, the, the shoemaker, was there, and they said, we went to a hybrid cloud and ran our own cloud because, you know, we're running our corporate website on, on, the, on Amazon, and no one will pick up the phone when it goes down. So that doesn't work, 
right? That doesn't work, that doesn't fly well with researchers either, right? When you've got work to get done. Um, we wanted easy budgeting and no billing subs subs uh, surprises, so you'll see, you heard again, again about that. And the other thing that we wanted was we wanted Amazon API compatibility. And the reason is that we're not going to ever be as big as Amazon, nor do I want to ever be as big as Amazon. And there's two different ways of working, right? So one is you can develop your code on your, your cloud installation on Red Cloud very, in a very small amount of money and get help doing it, and then take the same thing and deploy it to Amazon and run efficiently so you're not wasting time on Amazon, okay? Or if you're running on Amazon and you're moving a lot of data and you're sick of the data charges, you can move your instance back to Red Cloud and it just works. You don't have to do anything extra. So we really wanted that. And turns out, if you've read any of the recent press about Eucalyptus, that was one of their design goals. And instead of Amazon suing them over it, they've embraced them, embraced them and said, okay, great, let's work together and we'll have hybrid clouds. So this is really a nice thing. It is. Well, no, the, the interoperable was a design point early on. They just didn't want to talk about it because they were afraid Amazon would come after them. But then recently, they decided. They both decided this was a good thing, and they would. They would. So yeah, it's it's good that recently. I think it was only just a couple of weeks ago that they made it public. Yeah. So um, here's. So first thing you're going to look at this and go, wow, that's puny. It is, but it's enough to get started. And I'll show you one thing really quick. If you go to our website this over there so you can see it. So it's www.caccornell.edu slash redcloud. You can go to, well, I'll just go to the home page so you can see it. Um, and then all you do is click up here, Red Cloud. Anyone can do this. And then you hit system status and you can see, well, this weekend was graduation, so usage is not too high, but people are still hang hung over. Um, but you can see this is eucalyptus usage. And this is MATLAB usage, and if you could rewind like last week, both of the lines were near the top. But it, it, it's enough, okay? So what we're looking for is about, uh, we're targeting about 80%. If we got 80% utilization all the time, um, then we would say it's time to buy more hardware. But we're not there, and people aren't waiting in line at this point. Um, we hope to have that problem, but we're not there yet. So let me go back to these slides. So um, the MATLAB resource looks like this. So we have eight servers with eight cores each. Every server has um, uh, four gig of memory. Um, and, um, and then we have, uh, sorry, three gig of memory on these and four gig on, the, on the eucalyptus side. And then we have, um, we have eight NVIDIA Tesla M2070s in a separate unit. So one Intel core is attached to one NVIDIA t uh, Tesla M2070. And those are neat, and I'll show you an example in a minute that you'll probably be able to relate to, where um, you don't get charged extra for GPU cores by an MDCS. So if you can use them and get speed up, your Red, your red Cloud subscription goes way further. Okay, and, and, and the good part is that MATLAB has built in the CUDA support into, internal to the toolboxes. So in a lot of cases, you don't have to do anything except say, this is a GPU array, and MATLAB does the rest. Okay, so you can get some really nice performance gains. We actually, this slide needs to be updated. We actually have um, a half a petabyte storage available right now. Um, at the time that I wrote this slide, it was eight terabytes, but we, we have as much storage as you could possibly want and more. Um, and then it runs MDCS, um, and then this, this little shim that we wrote for, the, um, it's a Java shim that you just, you do a MATLAB install into MATLAB to make it work and connect. And it runs some tenes, test scripts for you, test connect scripts, and you can tell that it's working. So it gives you seamless access to MATLAB from your personal workstation. The reason this is huge is that the cheapest way to get MDCS is to buy a perpetual license. If you, if, and that, and so, that's great, except it's the same deal as having your own cluster that sits idle. If you don't keep the MATLAB clients busy all the time, you're losing money, and MATLAB's not that cheap. So by sharing it with more people, we can keep the subscriptions busy, and then we can justify growth on that front. Um, so we have access to the GPUs, and we also have what's called a quick queue. So these are two-minute jobs or less. And so um, how many people have heard of Hub Zero? Anyone? OK, so Hub Zero is a project out of Purdue. And it's essentially a web portal or scientific gateway development toolkit. So it lets you build a scientific collaboration portal. Then you can put things like conferences, papers, data, and you can launch simulations directly from a portal. So you could upload data and say, now go run it. So they're actually su subscribers, and they're actually running uh, the NanoHub and other different uh, disciplines hubs 
are actually launching jobs to MATLAB from, from, that, uh, from Hub Zero portals. And actually now they're actually looking at using Eucalyptus as well for other homegrown simulations. So, it, so you can get quick turnaround for those little things where it's a web page and you want fast response, okay? So that gives you a quick background. This is um, a, a busy picture of sort of how it all fits together, but basically you have a Dell C410X chassis. This is a basically a PCI Express extender. So you can put eight, actually I think you could put 10 uh, GPUs in this box and then plug them into the back of your server where they wouldn't fit in your server otherwise. And it's a, So it's an a, extension of your PCI Express bus. Um, there's the Dell C6100 servers. We've got DDN-based storage, which is RAID 6 with hardware uh, read-write error correction. It's very good storage. Um, and then we, we uh, the, the cluster itself today runs uh, Windows HPC stack. You don't have to run Windows. You don't have to know what the back end is. Um, and we use my proxy authentication, which was compatible with the TerraGrid. So you, have a, you basically use an X509 cert to authenticate. If you don't have a cert, we'll, we'll issue you a cert from Cornell. We have a, a certi certificate authority. And the rest is sort of automatic. So that's sort of a quick picture of how it fits together. Um, so I'll give you a, yep, sure. Um, just a quick question, and you might have covered that. I had to step out for a sec. But so how much, for this configuration, how much is that on charge, you guys? Um, we, they charge us the academic rate, is what I can tell you. Okay. Which is, we don't get any deals or anything. I don't okay. think Matlab gives anyone any deals. <laughs> right. They did. They did give us a deal when we were doing it for the NSF. Okay. But we're not anymore. Okay. Now we're full, paying full free. Okay. Okay. Um, and then secondly, I don't remember the number that we chart paid to be honest, but it's. But I know it's full free. Okay. And then the second question is in regards to. Uh, so I, I noticed each machine has four gigs. You said this one has three gig. The Eucalyptus size has four gig. Okay. And so if you have a process, so sometimes I'm running processes that like take huge amounts of RAM, more than four. So what happens at that point? Um, is it just it maxes out and then it's done, or is there's actually some infrastructure to distribute, you know, into other systems? On the MATLAB side, it's it's um, up to program design. So okay. it's 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 think of it as a toaster that runs MATLAB. Okay. So there's very little logic about how memory gets utilized. So typically, um, yeah, we tell people to try to keep their per you know per core, but that's on the MATLAB. So the Eucalyptus side, it's in, you can partition using VMs, but you can't do it on the MATLAB side. Okay. 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 And that, and I'm sorry. I'm no, no. If I remember well, one of the um, tricks or disadvantages or whatever you want to call it, when using the MATLAB involved with the MPCS, is that you must have installed on your desktop or laptop the same version. Yes, but we have multiple device. versions installed. Okay, so, that's so when you when you pay for your MDCS perpetual license, you have access to any version you want, including back revs. So we I think we typically keep three revs back. Okay. At some point, it gets ridiculous, right? right. We have people right. from ten years ago saying, "But I still want to use it." Now it's like, <laughs> but you know, it, within reason. Okay. Yeah. And, and the real the other thing too is that from 2011 B forward, the GPU. Use it, uh, code gets way strong, and so that's when you, you really want to upgrade to at least that if you want to use the GPUs. Okay, so um, okay, so we did a project with some folks at the med school. Um, Steve Lance, one of the consultants at the CAC, worked with Ashish Raj and Malosh, um, and th the question was: given two different regions of the human brain, how much how interconnected are they? And this is MRI data. Okay. And so um, they, they had code that they'd written in MATLAB that ran, and they could get really nice pictures, and I'll show you in a second, and nice results. Um, and, but it ran slow, and they were looking for a way to get faster results, including something that could actually become a clinical tool at some point. So the, the model was to um, you know, uh, work on uh, weighted uh, graphs and things like that. And the thing about working with GPUs is it's sort of like throwback computing. Instead of do, doing object-oriented, you want to go back to good old Fortran and vectors, and then it'll work fast. So it's sort of everything you learned in computer science, forget about it, and go back to the good old days of Fortran, and you'll run great on, on a GPU. It seems counterproductive, but it, 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 but it works. And so um, the end result was they got a 2500x speed up on the same code by basically creating long vectors and analyzing it. 
and um, they actually did publish these results. And they, there was most of the work was just by saying it's a GPU array instead of a regular array, but they did implement some uh, special homegrown CUDA that you could plug in as well. So I, I point this out because these, these same, the same consultant, Steve, is available to you if you want him. You'll see the rates, but even if, if you don't, you just want to use a subscription for computing, you have at it. So um, just an example of where uh, this has been used. And how long did it take them to build that infrastructure? I think it took them about, it took Steve about 16 hours, I want to say. Um, maybe not even. I mean, I think a lot of it was, it's hard to break up which, which part Malosh was doing, which part Steve was doing, but right. Steve probably spent, I would say, a day and not eight hours. And then in terms of the code, they had to refactor, they really just refactored one function? Yeah. And then that's what they were to do. Yeah, so that, I don't know if you've seen it, but MATLAB has a nice um, code analyzer that'll tell you where you're spending your time. Okay. So you just target in. So you can get the low-hanging fruit quick. Okay, so the next piece I want to talk to you about is infrastructure as a service, and this is the eucalyptus piece, um, and I told you why we went with eucalyptus. Um, there's others out there, right? So there's um, Nimbus and there's some others, and they are, they're good, but they're sort of very academic and sort of um, research project instead of like ready for production. And again, we're a core facility, so we need stuff that's gonna work and then we can get support and we can get fixes for bugs. And so the eucalyptus team has been very strong there. So we've been really pleased with that. Um, so you get basically, you deploy your own virtual servers on shared hardware is the way it works. And then furthermore, you can have your own elastic block storage so that if you want to have multiple people share data, they can build their own virtual server and then mount that storage and use it and share it. Right, so you could put sequence data or whatever you want on elastic block. We're actually actively looking at adding an S3 uh, capability, which would be low performance, intentionally low performance, to match the low price. Um, because if it was high performance, or even it was at first for a few users, people will abuse it, and then they will be disappointed when it doesn't work like the DDN. So we have to balance features and price, otherwise we shoot ourselves in the foot, all of us. So, so that's, what, that's what it is today. Um, you'll see these are a little bit beefier servers. So there's 96 cores and eight servers, so 12, 12 cores per server, um, four gig of memory per server, for, per core, sorry. Um, and then there's, the, again, these have 10 gigabit connectivity directly to each server to the outside world. So if you take a virtual server, in fact, one guy did this, he was complaining that he couldn't get enough time on a shared cluster to do some sequence analysis for a paper. So he bought a subscription and he basically had most of the eucalyptus side pegged for about 10 days, um, but he got his work done. And he was basically taking 12, so this goes to your question, he, bo he booted 12 core uh, instantiations that had access to all 48 gig to himself. Okay. Right, or if you have, and you'll see in a second, you could have one core and four gig to yourself. So we don't, and then you know it's yours and no one's gonna stomp on you. Right. Okay, um, again, there's half a petabyte of storage now um, that's shared. Um, and then it's, it's, we're just going to be upgrading to Eucalyptus 3.01, um, I think this summer's our goal, like soon, because it has the S3 support and some other things that we'd really like. Okay? So these are our configurations. So you can, the current version lets you have five configurations. So we have one, two, four, eight, and 12 core versions. So you can deploy, you can boot an image that has that any of those number of cores, you get four gig of memory per core. So if you boot a two core system, you get eight gig. If you boot a 12 core, you get all 48 gig. Okay, and so you can, you can control how you're gonna share or not share. Um, again, if you need networking and you boot the whole installation, you're gonna have a 10 gig pipe to the outside world that you're not sharing with anybody. Um, but you're gonna have at least a gig if, uh, if you boot a one core, right? So, um, each, there's also local scratch, and that's on the rightmost column. So if you boot a 12 core image, you have a terabyte of local scratch that you can use for whatever you want, which a lot of analysis want the data close, okay? Um, if, you, if you want a, a four gig, you're only gonna get, uh, sorry, a one core, you're only gonna get 20 gig, but um, it goes up from there. 
Um, you can boot CentOS, which is a Red Hat derivative. It's the free Red Hat derivative. It works well. Most of the national supercomputing centers use it. Um, you can also, uh, Eucalyptus 3 will also let us boot Windows images. Some people are saying they want to boot Windows images for certain apps. So, for example, you get an app that only runs under Windows, but you don't want to pay the licensing fee to lock it on somebody's desk. You could put it in the cloud and then share that instance with people. The other nice thing about Red Cloud is you're only paying when that image is booted. So if you shut down, you're not paying anymore. And we don't lock your, your subscription, even though it says a core year, is not, it doesn't expire in a year. So if it takes you two years to spend it, we don't care. It's very much like a Starbucks card, okay? So, so that's the, the configurations. Um, yep, go ahead. So how much flexibility do you have if you need some different configurations? So like do whatever I, you want. If I needed one core with, you know, like 500 gigs, no, you can't do that. Okay. You can only do what's on you that chart. You can only do what's on the chart. Yep. Okay. Um, and then what what kind of guarantee, do you get the same guarantees that Amazon gives you in terms of like if the server goes down, there's nothing to save, right? Everything, all the virtual server is completely gone. That's correct. Okay. That, and that's a function of the software. Right. Because if it wasn't, we wouldn't do that. Right. right. We would try to get you back on there so you could get your data. But it, it, if the... If, if you have a power out, you basically lose everything. Right. It's part of a security feature. Right. right. The idea is that if something goes bad, you don't want someone else to come in behind you and see what you were doing. Right. And then in terms of connecting uh, in the physical location, are there some of them that are actually closer together? So they no, get they're all in the high, same. higher network. Uh, no. Th in fact, we bought we specifically bought a, a layer three. Um, non-blocking 10 gigabit switch that has 48 ports. So we could add another, you know, 30 uh, some odd okay. servers to this so if they wanted. Physically close. Yeah, absolutely. And then... Uh, yeah, so it really meant it when, when you know, earlier I said it's reproducible yeah. and reliable. That's when it's a design point. Right. And then with CentOS, can you, uh, can you do other uh, OSs? Can you do Ubuntu or... We've had, we've had, we've, boot, we've booted Ubuntu and uh, I think we've booted Red Hat. You can... Um, it's, I think three, the version three of Eucalyptus makes it easier, okay. but if, if there's a certain version you need for specific reasons, let us know and we can talk to you about it. Right. And it's, I, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just using the KVM. Um, okay. So it's using KVM, it's not using Zen. Okay. No. So if you can use KVM, it, it should work. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, we talked about elastic block storage. Um, so we, we can give you volumes in one. Ter this is a, this this one terabyte increments turns out to be a function of the software again. It's a limitation. So what we've done for people at Columbia, they said they needed. Uh, they started with seven terabytes and they want to go bigger. We'll let you. We'll, we'll actually give you a volume on the NFS side of the DDN and then let you. Uh, we'll let we'll let you NFS mount it. So if you don't want to deal with elastic block storage chunks, you can do that. And it's really, we're, we're going to do that if you need a lot of data, not if you want less than a terabyte. We're going to tell you to use this. But if you, if you know, we will try to accommodate you if it's reasonable. Okay. So let's see. So yeah, there's, that's the EBS story. So as I told you earlier, my uh, Exceed hat, we were sort of looking at research use cases of cloud that makes sense. And we're actually going to have a website where we're actually asking people to submit their research use cases in the cloud to gather data and share it with the community. And hopefully NSF is going to have a solicitation out this fall for um, a, a cloud provider as part of Exceed. And um, so we're trying to give them data, NSF data, so they can, they can um, write a good solicitation for that. Um, so um, clearly there's a lot of work in pre and post processing of data and results and data analysis and things like that so sort of workflow support um, one of the things that we're actually thinking about right now is could you and I think we'll do this we're, we need to find a little bit of funding to do it but we want to write shims that you could run in your own local cluster so if you're using a Maui scheduler that if the queue got to be of a certain length you could automatically deploy more node instances on Red Cloud and then make them look like they become part of your cluster, send work there, and then when the queue sh shrinks, shut them down so you're not paying for it. And then we're also looking at doing that for Open Science Grid. So we're, we're looking at that. Um, today we can't, because of the way our network is configured, um, which will fix with, will change with 3.0, um, because everything's sort of behind a, 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 um, a, 
a head node, so the networks aren't visible from the outside, but we're going to change that in the next release. So that'll help with the, with the bursting. Collaboration is a big thing. Um, a lot of people are doing, you know, wiki hosting and, and, um, and sort of customized data analysis and computing environments where they want the same tools for all the people in their, in their lab. Um, and they want to make sure they're configured correctly. Web portals, we talked about Hub Zero. Um, and then event-driven science is this new concept that I heard about. And so the top picture is this dust storm that uh, hit Phoenix. And so, you know, it's really great when you read in, you know, in the, uh, the news how someone simulated perfectly where the oil would go after the Gulf spill. Great. That didn't do anyone any good after the fact. And so the idea would be it would be really great if you could accumulate storage and compute resources when you need them to figure out ahead of time where the problems are going to be. And nobody wants to set up hardware and keep it running for that. They want to do it on the fly. And so this event-driven science is you know an event is about to occur, and you want to simulate who needs to watch out right then. And so you amass the data. You have the computing tools already to run. Everybody starts working on it. They, they give you the results, and then they tear, tear it down and go home. So that's, that's a actually a very interesting um, use case. Um, another one is this education, and outreach, and training. And so we're actually working with uh, the Center for Applied Math at Cornell where they, <laughs> the students didn't know what they wanted, basically. I don't, so they said, we want workstations that can basically do everything. And, then we, and we definitely want Linux. So they gave them Linux and they said, God, we hate this. We can't get any of our work done for writing papers and presentations. So we want Windows. So then they switched them back to Windows and they said, but now we can't do our computational work. So, so what we said was, look, okay, here's the deal. They're, they're, the, the, the department that they're in said, we'll, we'll boot Windows and then you can run Red Cloud instances for your, for your Linux computing. And the best part there is you don't leave a workstation tied up in the lab, right? You, you, you connect, you boot, you boot your image, you start your simulation, you go home and that, lab, that workstation is now available for the next person that comes into the lab. We're also looking at doing this like for conferences. Say you want to do a workshop at a conference and you want to make sure all the software is ready. Well, what a lot of people do is say, well, just make sure you have this version of whatever installed on your laptop and then you're ready for the conference. And you know what happens when they get there, right? It doesn't work. Oh, they thought they th I thought you said a different version. Oh, I can't do it now because I'm not on the network, blah, 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 blah. So if you say, no, you're going to come in and you're going to remote desktop into a cloud instance and you know it's configured right, it's, it's, it helps you a lot with logistics. So that's another one. And then the last one we talked about was bursting. Okay, the moment you've been waiting for. Um, so here's our rates. Um, and so a core year is, is 8,585 core hours. That's slightly less than a core year if you do the math. Um, and the reason is that we have to account some time for downtime, right? You know, their hardware breaks or something like that. So it's not, the hardware's not, in a perfect world, is not up every single second of every year. Um, and you get, with your first subscription, you get the first 50 gigabytes of storage at no extra cost. So we're subsidized. So my pro the provost doesn't necessarily want me to share his subsidy with NYU, and I'm sure yours wouldn't want to do the same, would, wouldn't want to help Cornell out either. But we, so we charge you a little bit more is what it boils down to. And so um, if you want to use Red Cloud, it's $750 a core year. Uh, for Cornell, it's $500, okay? Uh, if you want to use Red Cloud with MATLAB, and this starts to give you some uh, flavor of how much the MATLAB licenses run, it's $750 for Cornell and uh, $1,200 for outside. And people ask me, well, what percentage is outside? And it's about 50-50 right now. We're getting a lot, a lot of requests um, so Purdue, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, uh, Whitewater, or not uh, um, Milwaukee, um, where else? There's, there's, uh, there's a few others. Anyway, there's, we're, we're actually seeing a pretty nice mix of usage. So those are the rates. And again, it works like your iTunes card or your Starbucks card. Your grad student can't go hog wild and you get a million dollar bill on Monday then on a long weekend, right? That that's what they can spend. You can buy more. You can buy as many subscriptions as you want. But as soon as they run out, their access stops. Their data doesn't disappear, but their access stops. OK? All right. And that's when you have a, an instance allocating, right? That's right. So, so it's so sitting there and it's not doing anything. No, no, it's not it. booted. Not right. booted. Right. So if it's not booted and you sit for three years, you still have all 85, 85 core hours left. Right, OK. As soon as you boot, we're, we're, the clock's running. Okay. When you shut down, the clock stops. Okay. And so it's charged by the hour, though? Uh, well, it's core hour. 
Right. So if you're running on 12 cores right. and you run for 10 minutes, okay. right. that's two hours. Got it. Are there also storage rates? Yep. Oh. Nice lead-in. So what if? What if you need more storage? So there it is. Um, and that's on the DDN. All of that's on the DDN. DDN. Does not include backups. Um, if you really need backups, um, we can accommodate that. But those are a lot more money because we don't run them. Those are part of central IT. Um, and then we offer consulting if you want it. No one's inter internal people use us a lot because we're a Cornell resource. But we haven't had any requests for uh, outside uh, consulting, but that's our rate. So that's our right unsubsidized plus some indirect costs rate that we have to charge outside users. So those are our rates. Do you charge for uploading, downloading? No, nope. nope. no, no, no. So again, this is it. So what you saw, that's the only thing you would get charged for. We don't charge you for network traffic in and out. Uh, we don't charge you for IOPS. What else? What other crazy things? We don't charge you a premium to have machines close to, to close together or to be guaranteed to have the same type of network performance or you know you know the laundry list so what you see is what you get charged for and you can assume that the hardware and the way it's configured is going to be consistent with what you saw in the earlier slides and you'll take hard drives too like I can give you so I'll ask you later about my particular problem that I'm trying if you're going to send me a USB drive I'm probably going to say no <laughs> <laughs> no I mean I have a 25 terabyte like uh, data set that I work with and I mean it's all on drives you know so rather than trying to upload that I would just physically give you the drive. We could figure it out. We'd have to charge you some consulting time to get it set up. Okay. But we could figure it out. Um, yeah I mean it's not that yeah. unusual of a request. I mean, right. Okay and so my last slide is where you can get more information. So we have a wiki. It's not running on Red Cloud. It could be. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, um, this is, uh, the, the top one is really uh, FAQs and basic how to get started and things like that with the eucalyptus side. And then the bottom one is how to do the same with MATLAB. And um, that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or. Uh, I do have sure, please. <laughs> Sorry, I mean. No, uh, no, it's this great. This is really interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of looking and, you know, working at Stratos to get some of my stuff going. So. You know, I have a 25 terabyte, uh, it's a web download, so I do, you know, information retrieval and web research. Um, so in terms of the Hadoop infrastructure, um, you know, part of the reason I was asking about, you know, the one in 20 is that typically, you know, Hadoop, I mean, it doesn't utilize multi-cores that well. Right. Um, or at all. Um, and so, you know, Amazon provides a sort of a Hadoop specific infrastructure where you don't have to get sort of the, uh, the larger instances, you know, you can get a one core instance with, yeah. with however many. And so what are the options in terms of, um, you know, like what is the maximum number of you know, computers that I could actually allocate toward that job? All of this. You okay. could access the whole thing. And if right. you did, and you did it all the time, I'd buy more computers. Right. Really. That's right. the I mean, that's, it, it sounds kind of crass, but it's, that's, that, yeah, that's it. Sure. I mean, it's, if no one does that, I'm not going to grow it. But if, sure. if, if there's that kind of demand, that's what we're expecting, and we'll grow the And then would I be responsible for setting up the Hadoop file system to or you can, in all the instances? Or you can pay us to do it. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, we sort of, sort of said, well, let's give the researchers what they're asking for. They said they can do it. Their grad students can do it. And they, they run root on their desktops, and they want it. Right. Have at it. Right. And then we knew as soon as they had it, they'd come back and say, but. So yes, we will, but that we, we didn't build our costs into the rate, so we kept the rates low to assume you're gonna do the work, and if you don't, don't wanna do the work, then we have to charge a la carte. So it's really just going a la carte. Okay, and, um, and then in the numbers that you showed there, so if I were to- Which one, you want me to go back uh, to the rates? Well, I was just looking the at config, the this one? that you have. Um, so I guess- Is this the slide you want? Yeah, so you said there are 400 36 cores, or how many cores? No, 96 there? cores total on the eucalyptus side today. Okay, 96 So eight, 12 core total. servers. So, okay. So then in terms of the disk space, I would actually run out of space, right? There would have to be some sort of custom configuration. For right, that. so, well, you'd have, what you, per server, you'd have, right, you wouldn't have enough for 24 terabytes, right? Yeah. So what you'd have to do is probably, um, I don't know, one way to do it would be to, to um, have your own file server that we run for you, which we can do, we can, we, can, we can figure that out, and then NFS mount it. 
Yeah. But that's less than optimal. Right. Right. I mean, uh, and I, that's sort of, you know, because right now with what with the things that we have here, because they, you know, we control all the computers, so each computer has uh, some amount of this. So one of the things that we're talking about, which might be interesting to you, is it won't work for Hadoop, but so this platform as a service is the next thing that's on our list. And the goal would be to put in on the order of a thousand core brand new cluster with uh, four gig of memory per core, uh, at least QDR, if not FDR, InfiniBand, probably QDR because of timing. And on the order of a uh, 250 terabyte luster parallel file system. Okay. And again, you'd buy subscriptions to use that resource, but it would be a batch queue. Right. And so the, what, the way you control behavior on the batch queue is you put you either put priorities or you charge. Right. And so you would burn your you, but you would pay like server year subscriptions. Right. And so if you buy one server year, you burn it up faster, burn it up slower. If you buy a bunch, and again we would grow it on demand. Um, the the advantage that would have is yes, you would have a cost to move your data over, but once it's on the parallel file system, you could really do a lot of analysis very efficiently. Right. Right. And then what are the options in terms of? Because obviously, you know, I would if I were to load data on, I would process it and then delete it all because I mean, you know, I'm incurring costs for just that storage. Yeah. But then at some point in the future, if I needed to get it back on, you know, I mean, it's not a trivial amount of time, I suppose. Yeah. So I mean, this is where again, you know, what researchers typically do is they, if, with with the sort of quantities like you have, is they get their own file server and they get a 10 gig card and then okay. they, they would push it. You know, and they would say, okay, I'm going to need to do analysis next week, so I'm going to start staging the data over to the parallel file system so that when next week when I go on, I can start using it. Okay. We're not there yet. We, you know, that's the next step of Red Cloud, but um, I'm hoping we're there this summer. Right. And then what do your researchers do in terms of, uh, you know, once the analysis is over and they're done, you know, doing whatever they're doing, uh, do you recommend that, you know, they just buy, like, you know, a Western Digital, you know, on, uh, you know, hard drive and just put everything on there and store it locally, or well, do most people actually want to just store their stuff at it? On, on the people do two things. Um, one is if it's, I would say, ten terabytes or less, they just leave it there. Okay. Because the rates are pretty good for that. Where where it gets expensive is if you have more than ten, and then we actually have models, and I haven't extended these to the external community yet, but we. There's no reason why we couldn't think about it. So, for example, uh, what we do at Cornell is I can just I'm able to just show you this. So let me bring it up. So if you go to, oh, I've got to find my mouse. There we go. So if we go to um, and you go to uh, our home page and you go, um, well, you can't actually see these, but I'll I'll let you see. I'll log in so you can see. We have two models for the storage. I don't know if I can log in. Okay, so the ones that you would care about are file storage. So TDN works in, in these this drawer unit. You have a drawer that'll hold um, uh, 60 drives. And it's everything is based on 10 drives. 8 plus 2 rate 6, okay? So the cost, most of the cost is in the drives. So what we allow researchers to do is to buy the drives and then lease the, the rest of the DDN infrastructure from us. So for example, if you bought drives today, three terabyte drives, they go for about 11K if you bought 10 of them, okay? You have to buy DDNs because they have special ASICs and okay. So you pay 11, you get 30 raw terabytes for 11K after formatting, you're at somewhere around, formatting in RAID 6, you're at about 23 to 27 usable, okay? Which isn't too shabby for 11K. You pay 27, this is subsidized, so it would be more for you, but just to give you an idea, internal paid $2,700 a year for the disk slots. Okay, for all of them? For all of them. Okay. So, so, then, so then, so in fact, this is what Life Sciences did. So they, they actually bought a whole drawer's worth of disks, and then they put Gluster, a parallel file system, on top of it and serve all the bio, the life sciences people in Ithaca with it. Okay. And, and that was a really good model for them. 
and that and they actually replicate their data across across those machines, or or there's are there any guarantees in terms of no? So the cluster is a is a uh, a parallel file system that's embedded in Red Hat. Okay. And so what they did was they bought two. So DDN is really a cool device for research because it's sort of flexibility in every direction you want if you can play by the rules, which is this eight plus two rate six unit. Okay, so it's a it's a high cost to enter, but if you have a lot of data, it's not a high cost. It's a high cost for the people that complain that their USB drives cost them fifty bucks at Newegg. Why don't yours? Right. It's, but everybody else gets it. Right. So the deal is. Um, the logic head of the DDN that does the error correction and the, and the file serving isn't the file server. It hangs off of an IP switch. And you can hang as many IP switches as you want off and just, and just mount the blocks to the right server. Okay? So if you want to set up a Lustre parallel file system on the same DDN that I'm serving NFS data to John, you can do that. Right. So we'll charge you to, su to support your own server. So we had this guy James Van Een in Cornell. He bought two servers. We charge it for cluster maintenance for two file servers, which is about, for internal, it's about $4,800 a year. That's patching and everything. For both? And for both. For both. And then that, that um, he runs Gluster on it. So pe all the life sciences people put all their data on the 60 drives that he bought. Right. And because it's Gluster, they can, do parallel, they, can, they can access it from wherever they want in a right. pretty reasonable fashion. Right. And again, if you put your resources in our data center, it's at 10 gigs. So this goes back to the earlier discussion we we're having about hmm, maybe we should all get together and share a data center instead of paying, you know, SunGuard. Um, uh, this is where it makes sense because you can colo your compute. You know, storage is not an island, right? Put the compute resources near the storage. The same thing you were talking about is Amazon works in universities too. Put the stuff close together if you can, and you'll have better performance. And so that's. We're, we're actually working towards it. So the other thing that we're working on now, John and I are actively working on, is something called Red Cloud Secure. And so this would be a HIPAA compliant Red Cloud. It would be just the eucalyptus side. And it initially, our, our, we envision an extension of the Cornell, Wild Cornell Secure Network to Ithaca. If we can make that happen, we've already got money in the budget to build the eucalyptus resources to do that. Okay, so if we did that, you know, what would it take to share that with other schools? I don't know, but we're here. We'll be. At, we can come to other meetings. We should start talking about these things, right? And it's a lot. You know, eggs are cheaper in the country. So is power cooling in space, right? <laughs> and staff. So the ten drives that you, the, it's a minimum of ten drives that you need. I guess that's because the if you want to lease the slots. Yeah. And, and again, we don't. This is not an option we're letting outside users do yet. I'd have to basically, okay, so you guys are university, so you know what it, and because I'm a core facility and I'm a service facility, I can't make money, right? I'm not for profit, right? So any rate I propose has to be run through the Department of Financial Affairs and approved, including external rates. So I have to come up with a rates proposal and say, I want to offer this to outside users, here's why, and here's what I'm going to charge them, which is going to include no provost subsidy, plus some indirect costs, blah, blah, blah. And they have to rubber stamp it. And once I do it, I can do it. And I've, br I've you know, broken new ground just by doing this with Red Cloud. So now they sort of know that I know the process, so we can we can work through it. So it, what drives me to do that? Demand. So if you came to me and said, "This is what we want," boy, I'd love to buy. And actually, Columbia started doing this too. You know, we would love to buy 50 terabytes. Can we do that? More. If I get requests, then I'm motivated to do it. If I get onesie twosies, it's kind of like. Mm -hmm. Would tools like Star Cluster, for example, work with Alertus in the Red Cloud? No, are you familiar with Star Cluster? No. Star Cluster is, is a command line tool that supports the API of the Amazon Web Service. Oh. It lets you deploy a cluster of. of, of uh, we haven't done any of that work. But I haven't done just a single instance. I, I don't know. It's a good question. We haven't, we, haven't done, so we haven't done really any work with improving the interface okay. to Eucalyptus. And the reason is that. To be honest, initially this was an experiment. We th I told you, you had to have an answer for why, why shouldn't we just outsource the CAC? And it grew into something that was a good reason. And you know, the first meeting I had with faculty was they were like, oh, and I want this and this and this, and the laundry list was from here to the end of the table. And I'm like, they hadn't spent a dime yet. Mm -hmm. And I, just built a, I had just built a funding model which said I'm not gonna spend any effort because you're gonna do everything. Right, so, it, so I, I said, no. So I said, if I get enough requests for a certain type of thing, 
that means I'll increase sales and therefore make more money, then it's just for a little business, right? We'll do it. If, if, if I get eight million little requests for, and I'm not saying yours isn't a good request. There's lots of good requests. It's just a matter of prioritizing. And so, you know, I think conceptually it should just work because it's Amazon compatible. Yes. We haven't tried it. But, you know, we, we welcome the kind of feedback yes. and, and, and also, you know, other things you guys would like to see. Yes. You know, I actually think the S3 computer storage model is really cool. So here's another good example, right? So we, we talked to uh, Dell about adding, they have some really new, cool new storage devices for HPC, okay? And I said, what I really want is three tiers of storage. I want my DDN tier, which is about a grand, $1,000 a terabyte a year. I want something around tier two for around $200 a terabyte a year. And then I want something in tier three, which is about $50 a terabyte a year for archive, okay? And they came back and they had this beautiful configuration tape library, blah, 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 all glues together, seamless, it all looks like NFS, beautiful. And the prices were right in line. And then I added how much work I'd have to do to make it work, and the prices aren't in line. And the reason it's hard is if I build a shared file server, every time someone comes to me with, just like you guys did, but I want mine NFS wanted. No, I don't, I want it this way, or I want it that way. My work goes up, and I have to recover, or my staff <coughs> don't have jobs. So what I really want is self-service, just like the cloud, um, and a low cost. And so it looks like they're, they actually are gonna have uh, some new storage devices, which I think are gonna be targeted for the cloud market, that would let you build S3 storage and sort of self-service model, right. very much the way Eucalyptus is a self -service. And then I can charge the low price because we don't do anything, it's your problem, right? right. <clears throat> Could you repeat and summarize the costs for the drawer of drives? So yeah. That was something like yeah. 240 terabyte usable? No, 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 no. So, so you have 10 drive slots. Think of it as a tape library, right? So you, you, and it's RAID 6. So eight drives plus two parity, okay? So if you bought three terabyte drives today, raw would be 24 ter uh, would be actually uh, uh, 30 terabytes, but, but you lose two. And then when you add a file system, you lose a little bit more. So it's somewhere between 23 and 27 uh, usable at the end of the day. And then, yeah, so the buy-in is the price of those drives, which is about 11K right now. Just, just today's number, you know, next week they'll be cheaper. So, you know, the same, or next week they'll have four terabytes and the three terabytes will be really cheap. And then, um, and then you have to lease the, the drawer infrastructure and the logic infrastructure from us at $2,700 for 10 slots for a year. We have a backup to our main data. What's it like 400 terabytes now, you guys? Uh, how about well, the, what's so, the backup so, ice line? Yeah, yeah, like 400 terabytes. So, so all the ice line together, those. we have about a petabyte, but it's right. divided between primary and, right. and backup. So that so. would be 20 of those drawers, right? So each drawer you have, yeah, yeah, yeah like well, 20. It's, it's Plan units, basically. I mean, the minimum is 10 drives because it's in the end, it's a minimum of 10 drives. No, it's the way their logic, the okay. way their logic, their parity logic works. So okay. every time you do a read or write on the DDN, they're doing on the fly read and write error correction. Yes. And the reason that's important is you don't get silent data corruption. So if you park data on a disk and you walk away in three years, it may not be there, just like tape if you come back in three years. The DDN assures you that it will be. So you pay a little bit of a premium for that. But again, it's not that much of a premium that if you don't want to do backups, you, so you don't have a warm fuzzy that your data is better off than the USB drive on your shelf. Any more questions for Dave? I have cards if anyone wants them, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you more if you have any follow-up okay. questions. Thank you, speaker. Thank you. Thank you.